the music. You will be inspired to think higher, realize your gift. Join the music and share the Trina. Turn this up and through your speakers is the new music. Oh, music. Good evening to everybody. And yes, you are listening and you are watching. The Muse is behind the music. And I am your host, Michelle Fallon. Uh, tonight, uh, first, forgive forgive me, a little bit of technical difficulties. Y'all already understand how some of this these things happen for us. But here we are. And I am delighted for you all to meet and, and share in um, a, a brief moment to get to know the Dr. Jason Max Ferdinand, who has been uh, a dynamic force in the choral conducting world. He has come in with a bit of fire, as I would like to say it through my mouth, uh, and has taken the Aeolians at Oakwood University to new levels where we in the world have heard about this amazing, like I, I don't even think that the vocabulary that I will use tonight can really define how dynamic of a group the Aeolians are and what they have accomplished under the baton of Dr. Jason Ferdinand. Uh, you know, I, I say all the time, if, if you've heard me before, there's something about the seventh day at Venice that I feel like God has given them an extra dose of the Holy Ghost, especially when it comes to the music making. I have never heard um, a bad seventh day at Venice musician. And um, I'm just excited that he is here. You know, it's also in the blood because he's got West Indian roots. He's hailing out of Trinidad and Tobago. Now my family is from Jamaica, but you know, it's still okay. We love him uh, anyway. And uh, received his bachelor of arts in piano performance from Oakwood, his master's in choral conducting from Morgan State and working with, um, <laughs> some dynamic uh, people uh, at Morgan and the doctor of musical arts in choral conducting uh, from the University of Maryland. You know, Nathan Carter, as I go back to thinking about Morgan uh, State University, uh, definitely had an impact on my life, although I didn't work with him often because I was at the real HU, that being Howard University. Um, you know, we did a lot of partnerships and collaborations. And I tell you that I could just sit there and listen and watch him work. And uh, God rest his soul. Uh, Dr. Carter had a bit of, uh, he would fly off. I thought, you know, that must be something with all choral conductors, but he had a way about him and he always got the job done. Uh, during his undergraduate experience, I'm back to uh, Jason at Oakwood, he studied with Dr. Wayne Buckner and was afforded the opportunity to become the student conductor and accompanist of the choir and also um, performed with uh, Dr. Lloyd Mallory, as so many of us know. Um, and he actually performed a lot of Jason's choral arrangements uh, to get that out there. At University of Maryland, he was under um, Dr. Edward McCleary, um, a protege of who was a protege of the late Robert Shaw. Just so many experiences and full and impactful life. What I am most impressed about is what he decided to do at Oakwood University to make sure that. Um, no longer, and, and, and I'm going to talk to him about this, no longer would um, the Seventh-day Adventists be just into this um, four-walled box, but now that the world could know who they were, who the Aeolians were in the representation. I'm excited. I hope you're excited to share this um, with others, and let's just enjoy a dynamic conversation with friend and colleague, Dr. Jason Max Ferdinand. Hello, good brother. 
Hey, Michelle, how you doing? I am doing well. And it is so good to see you. It's good to have you. I know that your life is cuckoo for Cocoa Pups. Right. <laughs> Yes. Okay. So uh, uh, I appreciate the time. I'm going to shift this. I'm, I'm always trying to find a good setting. I, I appreciate the time and the energy and the effort of you being here. Uh, someone just said, go Terps, uh, dear friend, Amy Elizabeth. Yes. Yeah, go yes. Terps. Uh, go Terps for it. And you are on your way back. But before we even get into that, you know, there are a lot of people who don't really know who you are. And I did share that you are coming out of the fine island of Trinidad and Tobago. Yeah, yeah. How long have you been in the States, though? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. So, I, yes, I was born and, by all intents and purposes, raised in Trinidad and Tobago. But the first three years of my life, I spent in the United States. Oh, okay. Studying in Michigan. And, um, but, you know, I have no recollection of that. But I came to the States to study as a student in 1997. That's when I went to Oakwood as a junior-ish in, in college. Yeah. I like, I like the, the junior-ish. There yeah. could be a lot of breadth and depth behind that story yeah. in itself. Well, 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 there is, because I was coming from Trinidad, which was in the British schooling system. Mm -hmm. And I had just decided to go into music as my career. So... So things didn't line up exactly as a junior, but you know, I spent two years at Oakwood. That's why I said junior. So I came in and I and I got out in two years because um, I, I I didn't plan to spend too much longer um, at that stage. But yeah, so that's why I use the term junior ish. <laughs> yeah, I love that. I know that's right, Jason. How did it start for you? You know, we all have our our stories of you know coming into this music field. What were what were your humble beginnings? Um, you know, I, I don't recall ever not being a part of something musical. So I grew up on a university campus, uh, kind of like Oka reminds me of, of that. Uh, at the time, it was called Caribbean Union College. It's now mm -hmm. called the uh, University of the Southern Caribbean. And my, my dad was a university administrator there for decades, I guess. So we grew up on a college campus, and the college campus always had choirs and small groups, and all the kids took piano lessons and joined the orchestra. Or at the time, we had a very vibrant children's choir on campus, mm -hmm. run by, we call her Auntie Cheryl, Auntie Cheryl and Uncle Elton. And um, they had a vibrant children's choir. I mean, I, you know, we would take trips through the island to sing and stuff. It was like a thing. Um, so I was always doing music, singing choir and piano lessons and trumpet and that sort of thing. So, you know, that's that's how life starts for me musically on, on a very bright yeah. musical campus. So if you weren't going to do music, what would you what would you have done? Uh, medicine. Me too. Yeah. I call myself a doctor, but y'all don't have to like me. <laughs> I'm, and listen, kudos to you all who have gone back to school because I, I have my master's, but I have said, listen, I'm not doing it. Somebody needs to give me an honorary doctorate because it's a, it's a lot of work that goes into yeah. it. But yeah. So what was the deciding factor for you? When did you just say, I really, I need to be in the music field? Right. So kind of in that ish period I talked about. Yeah. Um, so. You know, it's kind of like a sophomore-ish, but again, it was a, a totally different system. I said to myself, okay, Jason, if this semester I do really well academically, I'm going to switch to music. And, and here's why. That semester I was doing a heavy load of sciences, biology, chemistry, physics. Mm. But at the very same time, I think I was doing my grade six Royal Schools of Music piano exam, my grade six Royal Schools of Music theory exams. I took um, a choir we had formed to the, uh, what do they call it? The uh, the music festival that the whole entire island of Trinidad yeah. and Tobago had, and judges would come from England. And I was very busy that semester. I think I think that semester too, uh, the chair of the music department at the university had me actually conduct in the university choir because they had no one else at the time and she just wanted to play. So I was just really busy and I said, you know what, if I do really well academically, I'm going to go with my passion, which was music. I was re doing really well in the sciences, but after a while, I got tired of hearing about 
disease scheme and glycolysis and Krebs cycle and photosynthesis. I was just over it. And, uh, <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I made a decision then. I, I, I did really well academically. The, the choir in the music festival did really well. I passed all those exams I mentioned. And I said, you know what, I'm just going to follow my passion. And uh, I made that decision one eventful night <laughs> in mm -hmm. that and I um, was really too scared to tell my parents face to face. I, I wrote them a letter. L O L. Uh, you, your parents are Jamaican, you know. You, yes. you don't say, hey, I want to be a classical musician. Uh, what? <laughs> well, you know what, Jason? I, I must say that, you know, um, it was a little different for me. So, you know, my father and mother have been like the staunch supporters from I was four that they were. They just said, if you want the music thing, we have you. And that was very different because yeah. my dad actually had gotten a scholarship from NYU to come to the States uh, for the opera. Wow. And he did not take it because of that whole stigma on, yeah. you know, you got to make some money. You have to have stability. Yeah, yeah. And that's something to fall back on. Yeah. But I'm grateful that I had it because I was going to ask, how did your parents receive it? What did you say in that note? Mom, so, yeah. so let me be clear. My, I wasn't even sure which side of the fence my parents would be. That pressure was more of a societal one, right? Yeah. I mean, in Trinidad, you know, you become a, a doctor or a, a lawyer or something. Um, so what did I say in the letter? I said what I just said to you, that I really just want to follow my passion. Yeah. Um, you know, I think I really have some kind of calling or something to do music. So luckily for me, um, my parents, especially my dad, they, they they always desired that their children do what they wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they said to me, hey, Jason, this is what you want to do. We accept that decision, and now we'll have to find, you know, what we thought at the time was the best schooling situation to send you to. Mm -hmm. And being a seven day Adventist, you know, we have many universities throughout the world. Uh, but Oakwood, by far, was the one known for music. So that's, that's how I ended up coming coming to Oakwood University in 1997. So you're at Oakwood and you're, you know, assisting in conducting. What made you say, I could make, uh, uh, you know, some ground here. Let me, let me stay at Oakwood. What, or let me come back to Oakwood. How did that transition in life take uh, you, you mean come back to Oakwood to teach? Yes. So, um, so it's kind of a long story. I mean, honestly, I wasn't thinking of coming back. I was at the University of Maryland doing my doctorate, and um, you know, I, I shared this story briefly at my my last concert here on campus. I, I didn't I didn't accept the call to come to Oakwood till the third call. Um, wow. I was at Maryland my first year, and they called then, and I was in the middle of my studies. I didn't want to leave to to come down. And then I got another call in my second year. Um, and I, I remember visiting the campus and, you know, I told the president, look, it, I, I appreciate the invitation, but I don't think the time is right for me to, to do this. And um, then they called me that third time and um, I really didn't have any more excuses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, by that time I finished my, my comprehensive exams at Maryland and passed them. I just had my dissertation to write. So at, at that point, you know, my teacher said, look, you, you you could stay here and finish it, or you could take the job and finish it, either way. So uh, I decided to come, and um, mm. you know, I was, what, 14 years ago. That's when you know that you're being called into ministry. See, people think that ministry is just the calling of becoming a, a pastor. <laughs> no, 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 no. You declined God <laughs> three times, and <laughs> then finally you said yes to the call, and I know that... Um, they were ever so grateful. I heard so many <laughs> wonderful things about that last concert. Uh, and I, I can only imagine being in the experience of being in a space for a long period of time. And then when you're finally leaving, yeah. all of the emotions yeah. that rush over you, did you ever stop and think, am I making the right decision? Um, no, Be because f for me, I spent a lot of time, you know, even before I shared with anybody what was what was really happening, 
to, to make sure that for me mm. and for my family that it was the right decision. Once 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 I made a decision, you know, I'm the type of guy no turning back. Um, you know, it was, it was a tough decision as as one can imagine. Yeah. Um, you know, you know, I could stay here. I'm comfortable here, but so, sometimes you need to move on, right? And and that's that uncomfortable. Yes. Uncomfortable feeling, and that's but that's how we grow. Um, sometimes we, we, we remain too comfortable and we get kind of stagnant and, and we plateau. But um, so so no, I didn't. I didn't. I have not once said to myself, you know, Jason, I'm not making the right choice here. I, I spent time really contemplating. I, I just know this is the right move for me and my family right now. Mm -hmm. So when you were there with um, the Aeolians. Mm -hmm. What was your strategy? We've had we have music educators that are on. We have core yeah. directors that are on. What was a couple of the goals that you had set for yourself um, in making growth happen with those young people? Yeah, good question. Um, I distinctly remember writing on a piece of paper, uh, you know, a few months before I actually came down to Oakwood, and I had, I had some clear goals. One of them was, you kind of mentioned it in your introduction. Um, you know, I went to Oakwood, I sang in the Aeolians, um, and then I get to the University of Maryland, and all of a sudden I felt like I was exposed to a totally different world. Wow. And when I say world, I mean, um, you know, the University of Maryland Chamber Singers, we went to Wales to acquire the world competition. I was like, yes. <laughs> I mean, it, it, when, it, when you talk about repertoire and um, tone, vocal tone production and just uh, just the way we approach music, it was, so, it was a totally different world. And then yes. participating in ACDA and you go to those conferences, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is, this is. So, and, and then we went to the World Choir Games and you literally see ensembles from all over the world. So one of the things, I wanted to do was to get the aliens in those spaces. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you know, and, and 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 I don't take I don't take all the credit. I don't take you know, but you know, things things fall off path on a logical journey, right? Yeah. And, and the thirteen directors before me all did their thing. You know, Alma Blackman was the first person to take the aliens out of the country when she took them to Poland. And, yeah. And, and some of the directors took them to Carnegie Hall. You know, so different directors do different things. And I just think at, this, at the point in time I met the Aeolians as director, it was just time to take that next step to get out into the larger choral world, as yes. I call it, and not just be a denominational or SBA church choir or go into a Baptist church, just on that church circuit. But I just wanted to really... Uh, expose the students to that and to do that we had to make some you know some decisions and some changes in how we did things to get to that next level um, yeah. you know you, you 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 can't keep doing the same thing to get to a different place right absolutely you have to pack different clothes and take different luggage and that sort of thing so so, so what was the challenge for you in and because huh, I, I I know what it's like sometimes when you're you want that that's a huge idea. Yeah. And people are very stuck in tradition. They're stuck in the comfort of the familiar. Right. And so you have to do a lot of convincing. Or you know, what what was a challenge that you came upon um, that you could share with us that maybe someone uh, who's listening right now. They're going through the same thing, and uh, they can utilize a tool. You know, I, I tell my students now in so many different forms, whether it's choir or my conducting class, or just, or just talking as a mentor. This thing about being a musician, and, and really in any field, any field, you have to have this thing it's called bravery. <laughs> yes. And, some, and sometimes bravery... Um, Sometimes bravery is not about convincing people by telling them. Mm. Um, so you, you just said something, you know, I probably had to convince people. My approach was a little different. My thing was I knew what we wanted to go. Yeah. I kind of had a plan to get there. And I just had to be brave enough to go ahead and execute it and hopefully let the work, yeah. let the results kind of speak for itself and not waste time trying to 
verbalize and convince people what I'm doing. Because sometimes people, like you said, they, they get stuck, they, they don't see it, so they can't accept it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, decisions run right into the repertoire choices. And, you know, over the years, when it comes to vocal production, and, you know, I, I don't like using the word, you know, I don't use the word vibrato, blah, blah. I, I, I use different words for that, but essentially people are like, man, why are they all in singing with this kind of straight to the tone thing? Well, again, it, when you study music like I have, there are certain genres that you have to approach differently. You can't approach every genre the exact same way. Just That's right. Doesn't work. And, um, so for me, I knew that in my mind and just decided to go ahead with it. And, and you know, thankfully, the results were seen when we won the Quad World and the World Quad Games because when you enter those arenas, that's when we sing in more Bach and more of really high caliber, you know, I'm using the term loosely, but classical music. And you yes. have to approach it a certain way, otherwise, you get marked down. That's just what it is. Yes. Um, so for me, I just let that work speak for itself. Um, and, and, you know, hopefully that convinces the people and not me actually trying to tell them. What I love so much is that you took this black choir mm -hmm. and you have showed the world that black people can sing classical music. Yeah, we can sing anything, yeah. Yeah, absolutely anything. But I still think that we have these mental stigmas yeah. on what types of music black people should be singing or they sing well. Where did we get that from? I well, well, we we could <laughs> we could talk a lot about, you know, where that comes from. And um, but I also see it funny enough in white choirs who feel that they cannot sing spirituals, you know, um, or, or they feel that um, mm. it's not for them to sing spirituals, that there's an offense if they do. I appreciate that thought behind it, but I think one of the things as um, a choral director or it just a, a musician is trying to get people to understand is that this is music. And in the same way that we have to approach teaching Foray or Bach, I need you to exactly. teaching the Undine Moore pieces or the Hale Stork, you know, study it. Exactly. It's still music, you know. Do you find, because now we're, we're in this world of, um, you know, diversity inclusion. Yeah. Not that we weren't before, but Lord knows that this is the hot topic right now. I was sharing this with Eugene when he was on. Yeah. And, um, I, you know, people are concerned about their programming and, and, and how can I make sure that I'm not, you know, not including things. Do you think about that? Are, are you, is that a part of your programming? You know, yeah, so... <laughs> You, you, you really, I mean, you, you took the words out of my mouth. Um, musicians, I think, should be practitioners in what I call cross-fertilization, right? <laughs> so, look, I may not know everything about the music of South Africa, but I shouldn't be afraid to tackle it and speak to someone from South Africa and learn the basic rudiments so that I can expose myself and then my students to the music. Like... So this notion of, well, I don't know much about that, let me not do it, that's, that's, that's a little ridiculous to me. That's learning the music, whether it's from Africa or from the Western canon, whatever, you know, it's all about learning the history of yes. not just the music, but the society uh, from whence it came, right? So, you know, as, as a black person teaching in a black school, I just write it a second, it's important for me to teach my kids the importance of who Brahms was and who Bach yes. was and, and, and how we approach that music and where did that music come from? <clears throat> um, was the music responding to a certain societal influence? You know, <clears throat> what's happening in the society? That, those are historical things that we all need to know. Um, now, we, 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 one individual is not going to be an expert in every particular style. But we have all license to tackle it and approach it and try to teach ourselves enough about it so it feels authentic. And that's how we pass that's it on. Um, and, and, and I'll just say this, you know, you know I'm, I'm about to leave Oakwood, so, so, um, but this will always be dear to me. Mm -hmm. 
through the years, it's always amazed me that some of the songs the kids remember the most or love the most or have a high appreciation for are the things that were not always in, 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 it was a challenge for them. Like, like, yes. sometimes we did Schoenberg. Yes. Airden, right? A very difficult piece. I'll be surprised. Oh, but for that was one of my favorite songs. I'm like, really? <laughs> like, you know, the kids who did the National AC Day when we did that Bach Motet, I mean, they loved it. They loved the piece. They loved the challenge. They loved knowing that they can tackle something that some elements of society think that they could not do. Mm -hmm. I love the challenge. Um, and I just think I just think we own it. We have our onus, a responsibility to our students to go through the entire canon, not leave stuff off. And then in response to it, um, you know, choirs who are not black, you know, feeling some kind of way about singing the spiritual, it's the same thing. Yes. Spirituals were born here in America. That is a critical part of, of the music journey. So, you know, dabble in it. It is ours. Uh, reach out to your friends who know that genre better than you, and, and, and you could do it. You have all license to perform. Yes. They, they, you shouldn't feel, well, I, I can't do that. I'm not going to touch it. No, it's, you know. It, so we all have a responsibility to really, to be all around teachers and expose ourselves and then yeah. our students to the wide array of repertoire. I mean, there's so much music out there. That we so need to much learn. music. Mm -hmm. It's never ending. It's almost like the talent. You know, you hear a dynamic <laughs> singer and then the next day you hear another one and you're like, you can get better. It gets better. It, yeah. I, I call it gooder and gooder. It's my word, but go ahead and use it. I just, I'm amazed at all of what the creator has just poured into people, yeah. given to this world the gift of music, and we're just not even tapping into, I don't, just not even a fraction of the greatness of it. Right. Walk through, you get a new piece of music, Jason, and yeah. what is your strategy? How do you work that that piece of music? You know, give us a small synopsis on it. It, it, it depends. Um... It depends. So, you know, I always tell my, my, my students, I approach music with three, three facets of curiosity, right? Mm. The, the, the first one is, um, it, does this piece call for my theoretical curiosity to kick in first? And I'll, I'll come back and explain it. Or does this piece call for my, um, you know, the more passionate side of my curiosity second. You meaning, you know, what was the composer trying to respond to? Mm -hmm. or, yeah. or do I need to look at, um, you know, how the piece was put together? So it, it just depends on the, on the music. So for example, if I'm in Bach, for example, you know, very structured, very analytical. I want to kind of approach it from that way first. I'll analyze it first. If it's something that's really text driven, mm. text you know, a passionate poem, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, some, something like that. I probably go in from the textual point of view first. Um, but it just depends on what the music is, Michelle. Um, if I'm approaching Stravinsky, for example, you know, Stravinsky, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm chuckling, I'll probably tell you why after. Stravinsky, sometimes the music, for someone like me who's very expressive, yes. Stravinsky is kind of very awesome. pop like and doesn't give you that space, but you have to. You have to approach that totally different than if I was in Brahms and I have a line. Right? Yes. And so it, it just depends on the score that's in front of me, what approach I take. Um, Stravinsky, master voices, I'll approach it totally differently than a Brahms record. But at the end of the day, the elements kind of all come together in a total type of picture that will probably be about the same for both. But the way I come at it is totally different, I think. I just, I, I love that. So some people might think, okay, this is collegiate level. How mm -hmm. can I apply this to working with high school or working with middle or elementary? What can I do to take, you know, break it down so it fits into where I'm teaching? Yeah, I mean, you know, different people have different approaches and I, and I, and I, and I get it, but I think the conductor at the end of the day, needs to know as much as he or she can about that piece of music. I mean, Here we have that, that responsibility is on us before we get up to, to, to teach the piece. Um, and that way our students get the best 
of the piece and the best mm -hmm. of us. And that way the audience gets the best of what that piece can deliver. So whatever we have to do to know that piece in, in and out, theoretically, textually, um, in terms of what, what the music is trying to say, yeah. you need to know all of it before we step into that room. Like uh, as a conductor, you need to be the smartest person on that piece at the time. That's, that's you know, that's my philosophy about it. Don't don't get up there and not know. They, they will, because the students know very quickly when you don't know what they do. Oh, absolutely. And they yeah. will let you know. They will let you know, yeah. <laughs> Without a doubt. I saw this quote that you have. Mm -hmm. And the quote says, we should no longer be satisfied with solely displaying musical prowess. Let us master that in the rehearsal room. Coupling hope with mastery could be the combination that produces uncompromising societal transformation. That was so powerful to me when I read it um, because it, I think it's a hard pull getting people, the, the artists, ensembles, artists to no longer think about all of the deep technique when you hit the stage, because you really got to do that in the room right. and to now tell the story. That's what I got for it from what your quote yeah. was. Where did that pull? What, like, where did you, because that was just it's beautiful. Yeah. Deep. Where did that come from for you, that moment? So it, it came from it came from a long a long journey, but um, th this this is thought behind it. Some years ago, I want to say it was in 2016 or something. Mm. It occurred to me that um, you know what, what, whatever we call this high level, let's say this is a high level. A choir, when you're at this level. To get to get better, the increment gets smaller and smaller, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, like if, if you have a program that's not doing too well, then you have tons of growth to make. But when you get to a certain level, there's to get to the next level is just smaller and smaller. And it occurred to me that um, there is another level there, as small as it may be, yeah. of people receiving the music and and they're sitting in their seats and they are not really seeing mm. or hearing technicalities. Correct. You know what I mean? The, I mean, if you think about it, Michelle, I, you know, I, spent, I spent a lot of time studying the great choirs. The great choirs, when I hear them sing, listen to them sing, I forget everything about, I'm not sitting there thinking about placement and all this. <laughs> I'm not thinking that the music is so good, it's just washing me over, and I'm just like, wow, you're not thinking about the technicalities. So, to get to that level, though, I think the music has to be presented in a certain way, and, and that's what I mean about yes, master the technicalities in the room, but there, there are other things now that have to be added. You know, I mm. talk about this a lot now, you have to add in a sprinkling of curiosity and a sprinkling of empathy and a sprinkling of optimism. Love it. You start doing those things, you start hitting people's minds and hearts in a totally different way. In a way where hopefully they don't hear the technicalities. They just want to sit and have a total experience. Yes. And and I think, you know, I think from from what I've heard people say about the aliens performances, be that a national conference or a church concert or a concert hall. You know, people just keep saying, man, the experience is just so totally different. Yes. And it's hard for them to put into words, and it's hard for me to put into words, too. But I think what they're talk, trying to talk about is that extra thing I'm trying to describe. And I'm still trying to figure it out. It'll probably be a, a life's work trying to figure out what those ingredients are. But um, one year, we took a trip to South Africa, 2018, to the World Choir Games. And we literally stumbled upon something that works for us. And, you know, I'll share. It's not a big secret. But we were in South Africa. We got there early. And I think we had about two weeks before the competition. And we were at this very nice hotel. And we just asked the manager. They said, hey, is there a room we can practice in the morning from 10 to 12, whatever it was, you know, every day? And he said, hey, sure. He took us to this room. It was basically like a dance studio in the hotel. And it had those, you know, the mirrors that wrapped the hallway around. 
And this was by total happenstance. That room with those mirrors totally transformed in a different way my group. Now we could see everybody's face. Now we could see everybody's body language. And, and instead of me saying, you guys look really boring as you sing this excite. Now they could see themselves. Yeah. And nothing better than students realizing what needs to be fixed because then they Absolutely. jump on it, right? So guess what? Every time we have a major performance, we find a room that has those mirrors the whole way around. So when we got ready for ACD in 2019, a month before the performance, we found a YMCA close to campus. Uh, we went there every Friday. Yes. And we would just check everybody's faces, check the body language, we did our staging or, or whatever we had to do. But that, that I mean, that just took us a little bit here. And those were smaller increments. So, you know, those little things, just trying to find something where it's delivered in a way where nobody's thinking about it. Oh, make sure. I mean, yes, we, right. we, we do that in the choir room, but you don't need to hear that or see that when we deliver it. Right. Yeah, I like I, that. You know, a couple of years back, I um, my senior class had given me mirrors in the room as a gift. Right. Yeah. I would always share with them because I learned from all of my voice teachers about looking in the mirror. Yeah. And I would say it individually, but now I want to plant the entire room with mirrors all around it because you're you're so right. They don't get to experience what they're really looking exactly. at themselves. And I, I love that. And yes, it's all the difference. I was sharing with you the other day about, you know, my dad had always said, you know, mediocrity, everyone's here. And it, they, uh, there are a lot of people who are sitting in mediocrity that make it look like excellence. There are very few people who are here. And it's those little things yeah. that you had mentioned that take you above this, I'm faking excellence to actually being in the superior. It's, we think about like Michael Jackson and Whitney Houston. There were only one of them because they were masters. Yeah. They were masters of the craft of whatever it was in. And a lot of people debate, you know, well, they're not really great musicians. Sometimes <laughs> it wasn't about the music. Sometimes no. it, was about, it was touching the lives yeah. of people. And yeah. that made the difference. And that was the ministry that they were called to do. You wrote a book. And I, um, I, I try to share with um, all of the students that come in front of me the importance of us as artists to be able to speak to conditions of the world through our music. Yeah. What is your book about? Just that. Uh, <laughs> uh, of myself and a few other high school teachers, you know, the summer, the summer of the pandemic, that first yes. summer, we shut down in March, whatever it was, and that summer we were just on a Zoom call just talking about, man, how, what are we going to do in the fall? And we decided, the small team decided, you know, let's just write some modules to try and help each other out and how we could approach, because it's all going to be virtual. Right. And before we knew it, we had all these modules with substance, substantive information. And we thought, you know what, let's just turn this into a book. So I, I can't take all the credit for, you know, that, that team of teachers throughout the nation, New York, can. Uh, Kentucky, uh, Maryland, Miami, they come from all over and we, and we wrote Teaching with Heart. And mm -hmm. we're actually in the process now of writing Teaching with Heart Part 2. And I'm um, going to expand it now, not just for uh, choral conductors, but for all the arts, for, for dance, for theater. For, for, wow, I love yeah. it. And we, have, um, it. we added some people to the team to help with those elements. But it's really about trying to say, look, no longer should we just be so um, wrapped up in the music, but we have voices. I mean, literally we have voices and we can speak to situations. I mean, George Floyd happened that summer. Yes. And, I mean, how can we just sit back and not say anything, right? Um, but so c c people come to concerts and yeah, they, 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 they wanna hear, you know, they wanna hear Bach and Brahms and Beethoven, but at, at the same time too, they wanna leave feeling, or they should leave feeling empowered and optimistic. Yes of life and, and and teaching with heart is all about that um how do we look at this piece of music and try to squeeze all the juice out of it whether it's a social justice justice topic or 
you know, sp speaking to gender equality, whatever, whatever it is, and really putting all our hearts and souls into it. And some of the teachers who have used the book, I've, I've gotten emails and videos and to see the students' reactions and what the students have been producing has has been absolutely mind-blowing to me. And, um, you know, I'm just so thankful for that team and, and for all that we did with, with that book and the process of writing the second one now. So I, what I want to do right now, I want to gift five yeah. people that book. Okay. If you are an educator, I want to yeah. gift five people. So I need five people to DM me Yeah. and you will have this book. The book is entitled Teaching with Heart, Tools for Addressing Societal Challenges Through Music. And I tell you, that's one of the things that, you know, the pandemic, it it put us into this space of where do we go? What do we do? Yeah. We're used to being um, together. What was one of um, the new norms that you have, that you learned from the pandemic mm -hmm. that you will hold on to forever? That's a, that's a loaded question. Well, one, a couple of things. One, you know, during the pandemic, they were all singing so distance and mass and blah, blah, blah. You just have to kind of learn to figure out what to let go. You know what I mean? Yes. And, and don't take the music making part so seriously. It was one of those times, it was simply about keeping the community of the choir together. It wasn't about, let me make sure your vowels are correct, because I couldn't see your mouth anyway, or your tongue. <laughs> right, right, right. So, I learned quickly, you know what? I'm not even gonna fuss about that right now. It's okay. So so as we come out of the pandemic, yes, I wanna fix the vowels now, but you know, we, we, we kinda learned to be a little more compassionate um about about life. So that was the first thing. Yes. Second thing, I I rehearse very quickly. That's just me. I, I don't like these slow blah blah. But the pandemic taught me to rehearse even faster. I mean I was a <laughs> I was amazed at stuff I could do in 30 minutes that would take me like an hour before. I'm like, man, this is great. So, so it, it really taught me, it forced us because we couldn't be in our room for a certain length of time, blah, blah, blah. So you really just have to figure out how to teach this material quick. So I'm going to keep that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Keep that. But, but spend, spend the balance of time on the other things we were just talking about, you know, trying to really squeeze out uh you know during the pandemic we spent more time with teaching about the composer right because yes. it's virtual and we, we couldn't really sing so i'm going to use the balance of time to really talk about you know the why of the music the what's of the music and that sort of thing so so by the end of the experience you really know the piece in totality but those are two two things that i cannot took away that the students just really needed to be um <laughs> loved more than ever before and yes Really, not to take things too seriously, you know. Oh, you don't feel well today, man. Look, go home. Hey, go handle home. it. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it, it, it's been an interesting time. It was humbling. It was yes. nothing to sing for. It was no performances. So you really just trying to. You really had to love music to try and do music during the pandemic. Don't d didn't you? That's the yeah. truth. You just had to love it because there's not. There was no rewards coming back. I mean, yeah, there no concerts, there were no conferences, there was nothing. Yeah. And if I have to do one more virtual choir, I'm gonna scream because I. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye, virtual choir. Goodbye. So, so that really showed uh, the students who really loved the music, and for all the conductors to the country and students of the country who stuck through it. You know, kudos to yeah. you. I get it. It's, it's been rough. It has been. Yeah. It has been. So you're getting ready to come back and and we're excited. <laughs> the we're is, you know, the folk who are in this DMV area, the musicians, the conductors, those that know you, those who have um, heard about your work, have been watching all of the YouTube videos. I'm sure that whoever is, um, you know, taking over at Oakwood, that they're very nervous because, I mean, no, this, that's uh, some very large shoes um, to fill, but also knowing that um, what they do, it will be God-ordained for them and to the level that yeah. they take it. Uh, this is an ever-changing city. There has been so much. I've been here since, uh, you know, late 80s. It's an ever-changing city. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it has so much to offer. What are you hoping to do? 
Well, to back up a little bit, I, I keep telling people I, at my last concert here at Oakwood, I told the audience a couple of things. I said, please give the new person a chance. Right. Uh, and the second thing is, they'll bring their own shoes. Don't don't try to Amen. go. Amen. And, yes. And, and shoes, like we all know, new shoes always get scuffed, right? So there, there'll be some scuffing. <laughs> you better come on, give the word. <laughs> no, I mean, let, let, let them make their mistakes and let them, let them do their things. So I made that very clear in my concert here. Um, my teacher, my teacher at the University of Maryland came to my last concert here. Mm. And matter of fact, on two days ago, I went to his last concert at the University of Maryland. Uh, and I, you know, I kind of feel the same way. He's a huge um, personality, a huge conductor, a huge pedagogue to, to, to come behind. Yeah. But you know, he, he's clear about it. It's like, Jason, you do your thing. Like, like do your thing. So what do I plan to do? To be quite honest, it, in my bag right now down here, I've been walking around this empty book for weeks now. Empty book. And I just have not enough time to just sit down and really think it through or like my direct goals. But, but I can kind of give you off the top of my head. I'm coming into a program that's, um, in my opinion, one of the best in the nation. I mean, Ed McClary mm -hmm. um, has built a solid program yes. uh, in terms of, I mean, he is, he is a master teacher. Um, he's a, I, I don't know too, I know many great conductors all over the world. I don't know too many course masters. You know, those people who prepare the course and then turn them over to, yes. the, you know, there are too many, there are not too many people who want, who even like to do that. He loves doing that. Yeah. And he is a master at it. And I watched him do it time and time again. And I really want to build upon those building blocks that he's put there. I'm, I'm coming into a wonderful facility. Yes. I've, I've visited a number of, you know, universities of the country. And I really think Maryland has some of the finest facilities in the country. So, so I feel very humble to be coming into a program that's is tight. A great facility, great buildings, great colleagues, um, orchestras that I can collaborate with. Yeah. I'm just looking to, to you know, bring Jason to it. Um, you know, um, like, like my, you know, my Ed. It takes so much for me to just say Ed. Dr. I know, McClary. right? Because you did Dr. McClary. Yeah. You know, he, he's, he has, he has, he's forced me to, to subsidize. Call him, right. I'm from Trinidad. I'm very I was going to say that West Indian. Exactly. That West Indian. Like I cringe when I say Ed, but Ed <laughs> has, um, you know, Ed, Ed will tell you he's he's very um, comes from that Robert Shaw school, and, yeah. and and we did a lot of the the canon. And I'm very very grateful for it because that's what I needed when I went to to Maryland. So we want we want to keep elements of that and then just build upon it, you know, build for this 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 new generation of musicians that are coming up. So I don't have my thoughts pinpoint yet. Yeah. But I'm walking in August. I'm, I'm going to be ready. Yeah, I know yeah. you will be ready. Yeah, I'll be ready. Know, and they better get ready. Yo, listen, y'all University of Maryland students, get ready. Jason, would they call you? Would the Aeolians say that you are a very firm director? How would they, how do you think they would categorize who you are in your teaching? At Maryland? No, at Oakland. At Oakland? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it, it, it kind of depends on when you when you came through because I feel like I've, I've you know like like any of us we, we change with time mm -hmm. right and I, I think I've um, you know Dr Carter used to always say you know Jason conductors have a way of mellowing as you age yes and, and I, I saw it with him I mean I was just telling someone yesterday I have VH VHS tapes for the younger ones of you that's. <laughs> I have tapes of Dr. Carter like from the 80s, 1981. You know, I have this tape from 84. And I could see him now. He's just jumping all around the place and he's real energetic. But then as he came to what's the latter part of his career, you know, even before he started getting really sick, I mean, you could just see something happens. You see with all the greats, Bernstein, yeah. Missouri, you just see that, whatever that thing is, just more sensitive. The, the settle. It yeah, just settle. settle. So, no, and so not think, in a bad way. It just, 
it becomes your comfort space. You know exactly what to do, where to go, how to do it, yeah, yeah. make it happen. Yeah. yeah. So I, I try to be real intentional about, you know, maybe trying to settle. Mm. It, it doesn't have to be just dependent on age, right? It could just right. be a mental thing and how you think it through. So I think it depends on which students you ask and where they met me on the journey here. But I, I, I think I've really, the intensity is always going to be there. Like I'm yeah. very intense in rehearsals, you know, very, very specific with things. But, but I think I've really started mellowing out um, of, of late. And so at Maryland, I plan to continue that there. But now, now I'm dealing with the grad students, doctoral students, and master students. And this will really give me the opportunity now to really um, pass on some of the things I feel so strongly about in terms of pedagogy. Like I love, I love teaching conducting. And one, one of the itches I've had for years is just teaching it on a higher level beyond basic undergrad conducting class. Yes. Really get into the philosophical and the uh, some of the real, you know, tricky technical things that I've been thinking through for years. And I get to share this with these these graduate students who will then go out and teach in universities and high schools, right? That's how you, yes. that's how you have that sphere of influence. And that's that's why um I've always admired the work Andre Thomas at Florida State for what was it 31 years, whatever it was. Mm-hmm. Everywhere you turn, there's a FSU grad. You, 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 <laughs> you know, I call it the FSU mafia. You can't. <laughs> no, not the FSU mafia. Uh, but I mean, it, it, it speaks to the great work they've done there at FSU and, and yes. great work Eugene Rogers is doing at Michigan. And you know, that's that's how you kind of you that's know have, have the you pass the tradition on. And, thoughts on, the philosophies on, and knowledge of repertoire on the approach. That's how you pass it on. Yes. So I'm really, really humbled for this opportunity at Maryland. And, um, you know, the way it came about, I just really couldn't deny that this was the next, next step. I will. I, I'm excited. There's so many people who are on, who are making comments and writing in from Trent Davis to Theodore <laughs> Corp. And Trent, Trent. Trent is watching from the Bahamas right now. And he said he'll be here next week. So we're, we're just excited about what you're going to bring, not only to the University of Maryland, but how it will also transform and impact the DMV at large. And that's that's important. You've also begun the Jason Max Ferdinand Singers. What <laughs> brought you to the space that you said, I want my own? Because, you know, there again, there are levels of things, right? Yeah. And and sometimes in some, in some areas of conducting, you can level out. No offense, band teachers, but if you're teaching just in, in high school and middle school, it's like, what do you, you know, what do you want to do after that? Yeah. Uh, you know, even for choir, you're like, we yeah. always want to, get to certain spots. Is that what your thought process was that it, I need my own, what, what were you thinking about that? Yeah, so, so, you know, some people looking at how things went in terms of a timeline, they would think, well, Jason formed that group because he knew what was about to happen next few months. That's not the case at all. <laughs> that group started very, very, um, what's the word, uh, fortuitously. Mm. So, to be very transparent, years ago, maybe three, four years ago, I had this inclination to start a program. It was going to have a totally different name and that sort of thing. I even made trips to visit Dale Wallen. Wow. I conducted the Dale Wallen Singers for 40 years. I spent four days with him in Minnesota a couple of summer, a few summers ago. And then when COVID hit, I just shelved everything. I was like, okay, this is just going to have to wait till you know we get through. So here comes uh, fall of, what, what year did COVID start? 2020, right? 2020, yep. Right. Mm-hmm. Fall 2020, and all of us, if not most of us, know the group that's like killing the world. When I say killing, in a good way. They are right. world now, which is eight. Um, they tour Europe, they tour America all the time, and have sold out audiences. Which is eight. Mm-hmm. Not just in musicality, they are very cutting edge in, in, in what they do. And they started this virtual series called Live from London. Mm-hmm. They are based in London. And they actually ailed him to be part of that festival in uh, the fall of 2020, right? And we did. Remember, I, I just said there were no performances. and there was Right. No... So our project that semester was just to record these pieces for that live from London series. And that's what we did. We spent the entire semester and we learned seven, eight, nine Christmas songs, recorded it, 
It showed on the Voice USA platform with thousands of viewers from all over the world. Okay, great. We did that, and a few weeks later, Voice USA reached out again and said, Hey, Jason, uh, planning a spring festival. <laughs> you want to be a part of the airwaves? And I said, Okay, what's the timeline? And the timelines were, of course, now being Christmas break, we come back yes. to January. They needed the recording, I don't know, really early. And I just didn't have enough time to prepare the kids to learn a whole new cycle of repertoire and that sort of thing. So I said, I said, no, I can't do it. It's just, we have no time. The manager of Voices 8, um, those of you familiar with the group King's Singers? Yes. Mm -hmm. so yeah, of course, they have various iterations of that group. Robin Tyson sang the group, uh, I don't know. 80s, early 90s, something like that. He was one of the counter tenors. He's the manager now from Voices 8. And he's on the Zoom call and he said to me, Jason, have you ever thought about starting a pro group? And I was like, yeah, Robin, I've had some thoughts, but why would I think about that during a pandemic? And you know how people kind of look at you in the eye and say something to you? And it, it just, he looked at me to that screen and he said to me, you know what, Jason, you might want to think about it. Mm. And when he said it, it kind of hit me. I was like, okay. Yep. So I slept on it for two nights and I said, you know what, Jason, what do you have to lose? It will be on the Voice USA platform. These guys are amazing people, have an amazing platform, blah, blah. So I just started calling friends and we called some people together and we had the date set. We're gonna, we had six weeks from the time I called to the recording date. Wow. We sent out the music. I you know. You, you asked me before, did I question my decision? That was one of those decisions I did question. I was like, what am I doing? This, this could be a hot mess. <laughs> um, I really, like a few days before, I was very nervous. And we got to Maryland. And I have to say, those people came in smoking. Oh, and yeah. We warmed up for about an hour or so. And I just looked at the engineer and said, oh, Paul, let's just start recording. Hit play. Hit, hit record. Let's go. And we just started recording the stuff. And we literally recorded the 11, 12 songs over the three days with no kind of prior rehearsal or nothing like that. And when I said fortuitously, that's how that group was formed. It wasn't like a planned thing. I mean, who started a group in a pandemic? It's the craziest thing. But I'm, I'm happy that I did. And um, the live from London presentation went really well. You know, even before the concert finished playing, we started getting invites. And already we've done a few tours, you know, uh, Dallas and Nebraska and Nashville. And, wow. You know, wow. And we go to Toronto and, you know, on and on and on. And actually we sing, I think the word is out now, we sing for the next national ACDA conference in 23. So that group has really taken off. It's, it's, you know, it's only been like a year old now in the midst of a pandemic. Right. It's, it's just been a real joy. You know, friends. Um, some of my former aliens, and uh, it's just been a joy to put that together. And um, and that all came about before the whole move to Maryland thing, right? So, but that will give me this arm of, you know, whatever you want to call that arm of mm -hmm. being able to perform. Yes. Just more repertoire and, yes. and share with the world. Wow. Listen, um, to be able to call people and they come in and they do the work it speaks to the love and the respect that they have for you mm. good brother that's just the that's just the bare bone truth uh, uh, and i love them and have that respect for them. They're, they're yeah. awesome yeah well i i there are people who i have spoken to who i will who have said i really want to audition for <laughs> jason's crew like no like they are totally excited about wanting yeah. to do that so are you having auditions? <laughs> like, because I want to post this. I want to put it up so that these folk can so, audition for you. It's so funny. It's so like I said, we just call people. And I say we, you know, the, the key ones of us who, my friend Angelo Johnson, who I, I went to Morgan State with. It's a funny story. Angelo actually picked my recital group when I was at Morgan. He was like, Jason, I got this. And he, he, he picked the 30. <laughs> He, he picked the 30 people. So Angela and I kind of do the calling. And, and, and But, you know, we, we've talked about, do we want to have open auditions? I, I don't know. I don't even know if we can a clear answer. Well, so. just know that if you do, you it's going to take some process in there because you're going to get a lot of people. Literally, uh, I'm telling you, I had two we, people who were like, do you know if he's having auditions? I really right. want to do this. So. Right. 
the interest is there and it's just being under the baton of yeah. influence that they well, are looking for. Well, that's very humbling. That's very humbling. And, I, and I'm sure we'll talk about it, talk about it again soon, just to kind of see what, where we want to go and what we want to do into the next season. But, you know, the, the people, for, for Angela and I, and I can speak for Angela on this, we, we realized years ago, it's so much more than just um, having a great voice. Mm -hmm. uh, we just really we want people. Yeah, you know, if you, if you have a great voice, that's a plus. But we really want people who are desirous about working with other people and very malleable. And, yeah. You know, like like I, I don't I don't do well with deep with divas and divas. Like right, that's, right. That's not my thing. Um, I I I always say I'd rather take someone with lesser talent but really want to work hard and, and, and have a common goal. And that's, that's big for me. So, um, yeah. you know, people who fit into that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. Because uh, honestly, we have amazing singers in the group. We do. And oh, I know. know. I've, seen, I've seen the pictures and I know <laughs> some of them in your group. Oh, I know. <laughs> and, and, and then in my, I mean, we have no slouches in that group. Don't, don't get me wrong. And my singers, they, they understand one. But then we have people who I just know are very good music. The musicianship is just so stellar. Yeah. That that I mean, and you always need people like that to kind of glue everything together. Yes. And so I think we have such a great mix. And then we have people like uh, Cedric. Cedric jokes about this. So Cedric Dancy, who was the original baritone in Take Six, is in the group, and he tells people all the time, "It's like, you know, man, I retired from Take Six. I had no plans of ever singing again. And then here you come, <laughs> calling me up, talking about." <laughs> And he's like, you know what? He, Jason is like the only person that would do something like this. I, I still can't believe he's singing in the baritone section in my view. I mean, that just blows my mind. But to have people like Cedric in there and, um, and and they do so many different things. Thomas Allen, who just won the yeah. Sarah Vaughan Vocal Jazz Competition. I called him up. Thomas and I went to Morgan together, mm -hmm. but at different times. I didn't run, I wasn't there with him. And I called him. He said, hey, man, look, I know what you do. I'm there. Count me in. I was like, really? Like, you know, Jason, I, I'm gonna need you to stop being shocked about this because, <laughs> I mean, the people want to really be involved with excellence. They yeah. they do, and they they know from what they've watched, what they've heard, what they have witnessed and personally, what they're gonna get, and that's something to be involved with. Yeah. That yeah. really is. It's a it's turned into a real family. I mean, to me, the highlights of the concerts with Jason Maxford and singers are the moments when we allow the soloists and the duets to do their thing. Because the rest of us are sitting there like in you know, amazement. I mean, the last time Thomas sang in Nashville, he sang uh, Misty. Oh I mean, my God, I know it was beautiful. Jesus. There were people in the choir like in tears. Like yeah. seriously, we were just like, you know. <laughs> And, and Cedric then, when Cedric approaches a piano for a piano solo, his lights out. I mean, he just has a way of just transforming a whole room. John Stoddard on piano. Are you, yes. I mean, yeah. So I, I just have so much fun seeing all the solo elements being displayed and Mallory McHenry playing a harp along. I mean, we have so much fun outside of the choral parts of the concerts. Yeah. Just, and just encouraging one another. And, and that's yeah. it. We That's have a group me. People are getting dogs rights and winning competition. We we just it's really become a family, and um, I I really love those people dearly. And any chance we get to travel together and make music is such such a blessing and so much fun. Well, I I know that the calendar is full, <laughs> and it's going to get fuller. And uh, again, you're such a humble dude. You you really are. Yeah. And you know, I, and I'm loving your work. I, I'm already here supporting you, so you already know that if there's anything that I can do to outstretch the hand, uh, you know, I, to continue the support, I'm here. And you've got a plethora of people who are backing you up. We're just excited about your oh, presence coming. I up. so so appreciate that. So appreciate it. Yes, uh, it's real. Yeah. And Jason, can you cook though? You're from Trinidad. Can you cook? I, I didn't. I didn't get that. Don't, don't it, shoot me, but you yeah. saw my face, right? My face yeah. totally got shot now. What? <laughs> you know, like seriously, like it, it just my my childhood, my teenager, I was so busy doing so many things. And my yeah. mother just figured, you know what, Jason, I, I'm just I'm not even gonna get him into this kitchen. So that that passed me. I'm sorry. <laughs> 
Absolutely. Well, uh, to all of the musies, I thank you so much for joining us uh, this evening, this morning, whenever it is that you're watching and listening. Yeah. Thank you so very much for your support. Jason, my friend, colleague, good brother, thank you so very much. Thank you for living uh, into the purpose that God has called you to do, and it is a ministry. When you all hear um, anything that Jason has his hands on, know that you are about to hear ministry coming out of his group. And that's what's so uh, transformational about that experience, that you are going to have an encounter with God. And um, I, I'm, I'm sending you all of the strength and power and positivity and the best of the best that as you continue to listen to the creator, yeah. I'm going to be watching. What I so creator. appreciate it, Michelle. I so appreciate yeah. that. Too. Thank you for having me on here. And um, can't wait to get back into the DMV and reconnecting with so many of my good friends, friends there and seeing the work that other people are doing. And, you know, feel free to reach out. I'll be right there at the University of Maryland and We'll start reaching out to people to come to these concerts. Okay. Yeah. I don't know if you want to tell people to reach out to you because they're going to bombard you with phone calls. But hey, <laughs> that's on you. <laughs> to my musies and everybody watching, thank you so very much. And I will see you all very soon. Peace. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.